Hi, I'm Alan, and myself and Ted are going to talk about um, Stockholm first, and then Ted's briefly going to talk about um, South America. Um, so this is Stockholm. It's made up of 14 islands, um, which is quite heavy, um, because you always notice that the urban farming is broken up by water, and water plays a huge role in the city, and there's a feeling that um, green space is never really far away from you. This is KTH Architecture Building, and um, it's located just off the main campus. It's right in the city centre in the northern island, and um, it used to be a prison. Um, <laughs> kind of still is. <laughs> um, the Erasmus program there, all fourth year, um, is conducted through English, and then the fifth years have a choice of deciding whether they want to do their thesis through English or Swedish. Um, the difference there was that you could decide which studio you want to do, you had a choice. Of I think eight to ten of them, and um, myself and Alan both ended up choosing Urban Studio, which was just a coincidence. And um, we had the choice of basic, advanced, uh, it was contextual, which is kind of how we would do it, and um, landscape, which might be the boat, <laughs> and the feminist studio, which was I think had like six people, it was like little curtains around the studios. And um, so the urban, oh, and as well, the, there's a lot more emphasis. Based on design studios, so the credits are broken up into two twelves, and there's two projects within each semester, and they're twelve credits each, and three credits for an elective, which you do um, on a Wednesday afternoon, and then you get three credits for an orientation course, which you do the first week. And um, so the structure is quite free, and um, the timetable is very different. And um, for instance, I have two mornings a week, and the rest of the time you do have to be in the studio, as long as you have something to speak about the lectures. When you did, and um, evening class are conducted, which you can get extra credits for if you want to do them. So you can learn a CAD, Rhino, where you're sitting in a, a lecture hall and you're given, uh, like you're showing how to draw something, use the basic tools, and then you're given an assignment. And if you fill them each week, you get your credits, and there's a workshop afterwards. And, and there's other things like the laser cutter and 3D modeling, the workshop, all those are, if you learn how to use them, you can get credits for them. Um, the thing about it was, that you're after studying for three, I did three and a half years here and then going there. And it was just different to see how people come at things different ways, different ways of making drawings. And there was precedence of fifth years. And so you got to go to that. Some of the studios, uh, the studio that Claire recorded, they were <coughs> with fifth years. So they saw, they all started off together. And then the fifth years progressed into their pieces from their first project. And so you can kind of see the progression between between the two years, um, and then the fifth years were all based in these like little offices just off the fourth year studios, which were just one. The whole, all the studios were just on one floor, so there wasn't a division. Um, and this was a much bigger, much bigger year. Um, I think then we talk about topic. Just to talk about um, the urban studio that we both did briefly. Um, we were encouraged to, well, we had to look at sites on quite a larger scale than we normally would, um, and how programs and systems work on a city scale. Um, and you rarely got the chance to move into a building, um, but you still had to um, have the same kind of thinking. So um, this is just part of a presentation we did. Um, it's a, a conceptual analysis of um, the meatpacking district in Stockholm, we had to do a project there, so it's quite a large site, so um, it was quite a different experience to have to think conceptually on such a large scale um, and still develop the project out of it. Um, so this was um, basically about the um, cars having freedom of movement throughout the district and the building just placed on it so there's no um, there's no safe safe for humans really, um, so that led on to um, uh, Planning route through four humans and uh, developing this kind of podium, which uh, was safe to walk on, and that led to this as part of the final presentation um, a route through the entire system for humans and re inhabiting the, the big packing district. Um, this is... um, so, as Alan said, um, the urban studio was just a We set off to kind of see the main sites. We looked up like the top ten things to do in Shanghai, and 
and within like a day, we were like, oh, that's that done. It's like tall building, taller building. And so it was amazing when the lectures came and they brought us to other places, which probably has, they stayed in my memory a lot stronger than seeing um, and all of those kind of things. And at the start of this, the Urban Studio, we were given um, a course and it's a sustainable methodology where we um, we were to look at um, design tools such as where you even then that are employed when people do these um, sustainable cities and developments. And we were to look in a transport and bring in, to, they basically were saying that these methodologies are brought in at the end and to bring them in at the start and to look at systems and to look at things in the bigger scale of things. So we were to look at, um, along with this workshop that we did in Tonji University, um, between a group of volunteer Chinese students and ourselves, we um, were asked to look at um, Changming Island, which is just located outside Shanghai. Um, it's just been, it's becoming increasingly more connected to Shanghai and um, with the new, I think it's the largest land road for it, a uh, bridge tunnel um, in the world. Um, and so now you can get from Shanghai um, to the island within 30 minutes. So it's a great danger of becoming sucked into the sprawl of Shanghai. So, um, our group are working on an environmental um, plan for the city, which was paused, I think is not going to happen. Um, but it was really um, eye opening to see how the Chinese students worked and to look at that plan and to see what they thought of it. Because to us, it just seemed absolutely crazy. They, um, the environmental plan was basically that you put a ring road all around the island and then you would divide it up into like autumn forest, summer forest, like eco Disneyland. It was just crazy. And so we were put on the road, we were working in groups, which was a different thing to what we were used to, and um, which meant the output of the work was huge at the end of it. And um, the part we, we divided up then within that. So what I was looking at was the morphology of the family structure in relation to the typology. And um, how that, because of work visas, that the, um, the parents end up working in Shanghai. So out on this island, and it gets left with this weird demographic of the old people minding the children. So going out and seeing the island and seeing the size of the houses that they've built out there, they've got these huge houses where they have no furniture in them because they don't have any money. And it's um, to the old people and all these little kids running around, and they grow their food basically on the doorsteps, and there's Canals running through with the kind of crabs. And, and so we were just to design a proposal to move forward with that. Um, because the, the studios were structured quite different, um, we ended up having a lot more free time than we did here. Um, so obviously, we had to go and visit some architecture around Stockholm. Um, this is just some sketches from the Aspen Library. Um, and um, I think. We both visited there, and um, I think the ideas of threshold and uh, light that we took from this uh, were quite important to, to bring forward into into fifth year. Um, and um, this is the Woodland Cemetery, which again has influenced um, a lot of my thinking for uh, the thesis. Um, the whole cemetery is a design experience. The whole landscape is is designed um, to control um, the way you move and the way you feel as you move through it. Um, so this part in particular is the, the road up to the um, Chapel of Resurrection um, by Levels. And as you move up this procession, um, the trees get denser and they have different, um, different types of trees. So it gets denser and darker and uh, the whole feeling becomes more morbid as you, or solemn, sorry, um, as you walk up the, the procession. Um, and I went to the front of the church then, um, this is the facade that you're faced with. So this is this, it's on a north-south axis, um, and he was quite adamant to have it on this axis, the, the entrance, even though um, the authorities made made sure he had the church on the east-west. So um, once you approach the, the entrance, you actually enter, and the large window um, up here um, draws your eye. So you actually enter. Uh, from the north, but you are faced then with an east-west church inside, um, which is quite controlled, and the light falls down directly up the centre. And then you leave um, through a different door outside. Um, so again, it's about the control experience of um, 
once the funeral is over and you leave, um, you kind of feel better and move down into nature again, leave a different way than you came. Um, and then um, we both um, found the seasons in Stockholm to be quite um, more drastic to hear. And the, this was um, around October time um, in the same cemetery um, on All Saints Day. And it just shows the, the kind of change in atmosphere that they have. It's quite drastic on this day when the place is filled with candles. Um, and again, this is another church we visited, and just with the change of, of some of the change of season, um, on the image on the left, um, you can see the ground condition, and you're laid into the church. But then, when the snow falls, the church is just um, kind of in the middle of nowhere on its own, and you find your own route up to it. So it's, the seasons are, are make quite a big impact on the on the buildings there. This is a place Cafe String, which was, I lived um, in the Ryan City Centre. Um, I was really lucky in one sense because I was close to everything and once the snow cleared up, you could walk everywhere. On the downside, I had to share a studio apartment with an Austrian girl. <laughs> so that was different. Um, but this, so the area that lay um, south of, uh, um, of a street was called Sofo. It was a design district. Um, that had loads of these cafes um, and the difference between when you went there, I, I went there at Christmas, so in um, differently to Alan, I went from winter into summer. So it was amazing to see the city just open up as the morning <coughs> came and even just trying to describe the people who came to visit in January and um, that the city just completely transforms and this was one of my favourite examples of it and um, that the windows slide right up and all of a sudden um, the whole place becomes outdoor. Um, and then this was something similar in Gamson. I think we all went to visit this when we went with Jan. And um, it was this cafe for hot chocolate, and it was that idea as well that how they inhabit um, the city as soon as the snow goes. But it was amazing to see um, leaving Dublin Airport this spring from the snow, the plane wasn't going to leave. And to arrive into Stockholm, where there's more snow than you've ever seen, and yet they still go about their lifestyles and they still. They don't stop, um, and even something that I remember, I remember sitting in Claire's apartment and we looked out the window to a park and um, seeing these little tots, like uh, tiny little kids that were wearing little um, snow suits, like little stars, and instead of being put into a room for a play school, they were brought out and they were just walking through the snow, which was nearly like half the size of them, and it was just amazing to see um, the activity of the city. And then I decided that I was really young and that was something as well that I kind of got from Stockholm, that nobody goes from leaving Surrey to college, everyone stops and thinks about what they want to do um, and then go, go back so you have, it's very normal, it's like first years to be 23, 24. I was young, he loved it. <laughs> um, so I came back after Stockholm um, and decided I'd take a year out. Um, so I worked for a while, saved up loads of money and went to London and um, worked there again for three months, came home for two days and flew off to New Costa Rica where I met my sister and um, we made our way down to Panama and this is, actually, this is actually the border crossing between Costa Rica and Panama. It's like neither country wants to take responsibility for it and I actually thought I was going to die. They, it, was, it was May when the border they decided that they were just going to close down for a few hours and there was no way of going across. Um, and then once we did, all these trucks had lined up and they wanted to get across. So it was like a scramble of people before I, the trucks came. <coughs> um, this was the Panama Canal and um, a couple of images of it. It was something that we'd spoken about going to before we went, um, but it was nothing like what I thought it was going to be. We didn't expect it to be so um, apart from the city. And I think that's... And it was amazing, even the, the journey to it, and um, all of a sudden you felt like you were in like American suburbia. And uh, the canal, they couldn't afford to build the canal, so they gave it over to America to build it and run it. And all the area around it looks like housing estates that we used to do the disease and stuff, just complete suburbia. Um, and the scale of it was just amazing. We were there, we were looking up to see two ships go through when we were there. I think they said it was um, it's 77 kilometers long, 
and it takes eight, eight to ten hours to, to go through it. Um, and it's back, it's the volume they can't put the demand, so they're going to build a second set of locks. Um, but instead of letting the, um, it's amazing the there's two little you can hardly see them, but there's just um, here there's two little trains that run down on the side, and they negotiate the boat going through, and the, they only have I think like a, like a meter that they make it through, that they make the ships as big as they possibly can to as much cargo through. So the next set of locks are going to be bigger. So um, so we left from Panama and went down to Colombia. And then we flew down to Quito. This was an image from the top of Quito. And I just I wasn't too much of a fan. I didn't really want to go up and see another city from a great height. But when we did, it was amazing to see the scale of it. It just sprawls and sprawls. Um, this image here is from a Sunday in Quito. They um, turn up the old street to cyclists. No cars are allowed. Um, and in the, straight ahead along that path, there's um, a cathedral. Outside the cathedral, I took this photo, which I kind of felt like some dull Quito. That the way that they build, it seemed to be the way they did it in most of Ecuador that we'd seen, that they continue to get ready to build the next story. Whether that ever gets built or not, they're always kind of ready. And, and that was quite interesting to see. And then this was in Colombia. It was the we did a trek up to it. It stands at, um, it was built in 800 AD, and they say it was 650 years before Machu Picchu. It's made up of 169 terraces, and um, it was rediscovered in, I think, the 70s by nature's and grave diggers. Um, uh, it takes, it's 100, it's 1,200 stone steps to get up here. Um, and, and when you do, um, the, where the photo was taken is from um, an army camp where the army sit up there for six months at a time um, to mine tourists because there's some kidnappings there. Um, and when we came down out of this, they brought us to a place which they called the Fountain of Youth. And when we got down there, there was another group of army men who would throw all their guns aside and were just swimming in the water, which is their guns just lying everywhere and swimming in the water. And then these are the people from there at the Tarona. Um, the kids, just as soon as they saw us, all they wanted was Oreos. And there was something really odd about that. <laughs> Thank you.